Barbara, these heirloom peppers are almost ripe. These peppers are called Santa Nicole, and the seeds for them were given to us by our neighbor Steve, whose Italian family has been handing them down from one generation to another. There's a real magic in growing plants from seeds you saved yourself. I'm Elliot Coleman. And I'm Barbara Damrosh. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll give you some pointers on saving seeds in your own garden. On Gardening Naturally. years ago every gardener saved seeds that was simply how you got next year's crop you'd put aside a few seeds from the vegetables you'd harvested and plant them the following spring and over the years one generation would hand down seeds to the next so that what you got really were heirlooms just like any other kind of family heirloom people still are saving some of those heirloom varieties because they have great flavor or interesting mm. colors or some other wonderful characteristic and the thing I like best about saving seeds is that it adds a whole new dimension to gardening. It completes the cycle. And when I grow plants from seeds that I've saved, I really feel like I'm much more a part of the garden. I also think it's fun when neighbors start sharing seeds. Like this year, Steve gave us some of his Italian peppers, and maybe we'll save some of our squash seeds for Keith and Chip. It creates a great sense of community when gardeners swap seeds. And it is so much easier than you can imagine. The simplest seeds to begin with are the ones where the part you eat is the part you plant. A good example of that would be potatoes. Now, we haven't harvested our charlotte potatoes yet, but if we dig in here and find one, we have either here a seed for next year or dinner tonight. You can use it either way. And if we save this aside, by next spring, the little eyes along here are going to start putting out little sprouts. You've seen that in potatoes in the kitchen. That is, they're ready to grow into next year's potato plant. Another example is garlic. We fall plant garlic, and we've just harvested a beautiful crop of garlic this summer. We're going to save these dry like that, and then this fall, plant next year's crop. The part we plant is the clove after we break apart this garlic head, and the clove is the same thing you would have used to make a, an Italian pasta dish, only this time we're putting it into the soil. Another really easy crop to save seed from is dried beans. And there's great variety here. Whatever bean dish you like, you can choose one of any number of different types of beans. That's why people save so many. I know a man who was a real expert on saving bean seed, and he had up to 500 different beans in his collection. The variety is pretty, and it really gives you a whole new hobby in the garden. Now, beans are true seeds, and they only form after the flower has been pollinated. If you're going to save seed, you want to get varieties that are open pollinated. If you use hybrid varieties, the resulting seeds may be sterile, or they won't come through to type, and you won't get what you thought you were going to get. Now, pollination of plants takes place either through self-pollination, wind pollination, or insect pollination. Peas and beans are a good example of self-pollination, and with them, you're pretty well guaranteed that you're going to get the type of plant you started with. That isn't always true with wind-pollinated or insect-pollinated plants. For example, the corn here, which is wind-pollinated, the squash blossom, which is insect-pollinated, can cross with related varieties. And so when you're saving seed from them, you want to grow just one type, and then you'll know that whatever squash or corn you started with, that's the type you're going to end up with. Now, there are lots of fascinating techniques you can use to get around that. So you can grow lots of different seeds. And there are many good books on this subject. I'm sure you can find them if you consult your local library. This tomato is called Moira. It's one of my favorites. It's a little late to ripen. It's worth waiting for because the flesh is so nice and red and good tasting. Now, I don't have to worry about my tomatoes cross-pollinating with anything. Another group of plants I don't worry about is my biennial root crops, like carrots and rutabaga and beets. Now, a biennial is a plant that doesn't set seed until the second year. So that if I plant my root crops the first year and harvest and eat the roots, they're never going to go to seed at all. 
Now, I'm going to save some of those to replant the following year to get seeds. Those aren't going to pollinate with my food crops because those aren't setting seed. Let me show you how we do this. A lot of the seeds we're saving this year just come out of the regular garden. But with some crops, we needed to have a special little seed-saving garden because we're growing these crops in a way that you wouldn't normally do it. It's a pretty ridiculous garden if you were to walk up and see it because everything's going to seed. And of course, that's the whole point. The other thing that's different about some of these is that with the root crops, they're biennials. They set seed the second year. Now, normally, when we grow root crops, we don't give them the chance to do that. After the first year, we dig up the root, as with this rutabaga, and let it just be our winter food storage, and that's the end of it. But when I'm growing a root crop for seed, I'll take it out of the cellar, where it's starting to sprout in spring, plant it in the ground, and let the top bush out, the way this rutabaga has done here, so that we get flowers, and then these seed capsules that you see here, and that's where I would save the seed. The same with this parsnip plant here. I planted this in the ground, and it would sprout here and produce a stalk like this. Now, when I select from my bin in the root cellar, I don't necessarily look for the biggest one, but I look for a healthy one, one that hasn't shown any signs of disease, hasn't started to rot, has the capability of sprouting. I can see little sprouts coming along, but it hasn't sprouted too far because I'm selecting for storage capability too, the ones that keep the longest without sprouting in the root cellar, and also whether it has a nice regular shape. The same thing with these carrots over here. I selected a nice healthy looking carrot, one that is good and straight and round and no branching, no forking, and I planted them just at the ground level so the tops could sprout up, have nice big leafy tops now which will form flowers and then seeds that I can harvest. I did the same thing with the beets. I selected some nice, firm, round, well-shaped ones, true to the type, planted them. Now I've got leafy tops, which will produce seeds. And I did the same thing with the onions. Now these little onion plants are coming along well. They've already got flower buds, and soon we'll have seeds. Probably I could get a seed crop in one season from the onions, but once again, Getting them from the root cellar enables me to check them out and see which ones are the best keepers. When I selected onions to plant here, I, I took ones like this that haven't even sprouted at all. This onion went all the way through the winter in my root cellar, and it's now into June, and it hasn't sprouted. And that's the kind of good, firm onion I want to see at this time of year. So I planted them, and up they came. Once again, what I'm selecting is root crops that are true to type, typical of that variety, well-formed, healthy, and good keepers. My favorite crop in the seed saving garden is this little miniature field of oats. I'm a farmer at heart and I really like the idea of growing grain, but also my favorite breakfast is a bowl of oatmeal. Now this is what's called a holus oat. It's an old time variety we got from some seed saver friends and the advantage of it is that when you beat on the little umbel that holds the seed, the seeds come out with, with no hull attached. And then you can eat them directly, grind them up. Regular oats have a hull and that has to be rubbed off by machinery. So these are a wonderful home garden oat to grow. The way we harvest them, traditionally it was done with a sickle. It wants to be good and sharp, but you're not using it in the old way of swinging it like this. You just grab a handful of the stems, put the sickle in there, and pull backwards with a cutting motion and they come really nicely. Handful, pull back, and that way there's just no chance that you're gonna swing and by mistake cut your hand. If you don't have a sickle or are uncomfortable with it, just get yourself a pair of hedge clippers. You can use them the same way, just, just as if you were cutting the hedge and then take the handful of oats and add them to your sheath. Now, the, the sheath is the way it was tied up and it's tied up this way to help them dry. And after you put a bundle of them together like this, sitting on a string, you just pull the string together and tie it, stomp the stems on the ground, and this one will stand up next to that one. Traditionally, these sheaves were put in about five or six to make a stook, and they were left that way. You've probably seen pictures of that in old farm fields. I, out in the sun, if it's gonna rain, put them in a shed. When you're ready to thresh them, that's what it's called when you take the grain out of the heads, just lay them on a hard floor, take about a three-foot length of old rubber garden hose, and beat on the heads there. 
That'll knock the grains out. You can take the straw, anything else that's left away, collect the grains into a salad bowl or something like that, go out on a windy day, throw them up in the air, the wind will blow the chaff away, you'll have a beautiful bowl of oats ready to grind and cook up for that delicious bowl of morning oatmeal. The seeds in our little seed-saving plot don't all mature at the same point. Different plants are earlier or later than others. So we try to come out every few days about this time of the year at the end of the summer and try to catch things before it's too late. Now, even if you're lazy, even if you forget about it for a while, take heart. The system is very forgiving. Uh, ideally, I would have come out and snipped the stems on these rutabagas when the pods were yellowing. But we've left these a long time, and they're still fine. As long as the pods haven't shattered, and by shattered I mean opened automatically and spread their seeds, you're still in good shape. These haven't, and as you can see, there's a beautiful harvest of rutabaga seeds in there. So I'm not going to let these go any longer. I'm going to snip these stems and carefully put them into this paper bag. That way, as they continue drying, when they do shatter, the seeds will be right in there, contained, easy for me to get. I'm going to put that bag away in a dry place. We're not going to need all of the seeds that this plot produces anyway, just enough for a little home garden. But I must say, in the case of parsnips, I try to get as many seeds as I can because I have a parsnip addiction and I want a good long row next year, Elliot. So I have been coming out and snipping these as they gradually mature. You can see that this one really has gone by. I didn't catch that one and the seeds have pretty much fallen out of their little capsules. There's still a few more stems here, Elliot. I'm just going to have some parsnip insurance here. I never have too many parsnips. Seeds. Right. Now, the carrots, I don't think, are ready yet, right? Look, if they're not quite brown yet and dry, and I don't think they've put No, no, the carrots out. have a ways to go, but I noticed that even though most of the beets are green, there's one stem here that's starting to look brown. Oh, yeah. I'll just snip that, take it out. The best time to harvest beets for seed is when the little seed pods are beginning to turn brown. As you can see, these are all green and these aren't ready, but this one is just at the stage where it's a good idea to harvest it, stick it in the bag, and again, put it away in a warm, dry room. We'll come back and get the rest of these as they mature. Now, when we harvested these peas, I just pulled the vine and stuck them on a couple of seed flats set up like that to let air underneath. And they just sat out here to dry. We could have put them inside, but we really like to keep it simple. And they do perfectly well out here. I'm just going to shell these right here in the field so that I don't have to bring all of this mess of vines into the house. It takes a little longer this way, but I'd rather get the work out of the way now. There they are. This is a special edible pod pea. It's an heirloom variety, which we got from a real seed-saving enthusiast who's a friend of ours. And we not only like them, they taste great, but we also feel that we're keeping an old strain of peas alive, us and a few other gardeners who are saving these. At no great sacrifice because they taste so good. Now, the last step is to remember to write the name of the seed and the variety on the bag so you won't forget what you've saved. Here's the little tag we put out here last spring. Always tender beet. Why don't you write that on there and then we'll know what we have. These seeds all tend to look alike sometimes, two months later. There you go. Now when you put them in bags and stick them away in your seed closet, you have a really efficient home seed system. Here's a great old-fashioned flower that you don't see very often in gardens anymore. It's a relative of the more common hollyhock, but it grows on a much shorter plant, great for cutting, has smaller flowers, but very lovely, white with these purple veins in the center. I call it Althea zebrina, but you'll sometimes see it called Malva sylvestris. Now, when I wanted to grow it this year, I couldn't find it in a seed catalog that was handy. But that was okay, because luckily, down the road, my neighbor Stan Joseph had it and was saving seeds. So he gave me some, and I planted them in soil blocks and brought them along. As you can see, it's now the glory of my cutting garden, full of bees. Butterflies love it, too, even the hummingbirds. Now, next year, I'm not going to have to ask Stan for any more seeds, because I can see they're already starting to form 
down here at the bottom, these little capsules break open. I'll take out the little brown seeds and plant them one by one. They'll form as they move up the plant as the flowers fade. I have enough here to plant an acre of Althea Sabrina, enough to give my friends, too. Like everything else in gardening, seed saving takes place over a period of time in bits and pieces. And so about a month ago, we went out to the garden and pulled the bean plants that these beans grew on because it was time to dry them, and we hung them up in a shed to dry them. And yet, only this afternoon did we go out and take these long-season hot peppers off the plants to begin to process them. Now, how do you get from the raw materials of the garden, the beans, the peppers, the tomatoes, and all those crops, to packets of seeds like this? We're going to show you how to prepare your seeds for storage. Now, with dry seeds like beans, the first job is to thresh them. That is, to separate the beans from the pods and the pod material. In order to do that, we stick them in an old gunny sag, a grain bag like this. The whole plants, we'll stuff them down in here and then tie the bag together, lay it on a flat surface, and beat it with a short length of garden hose. The whole idea is to break up the materials inside so the beans separate from the rest of the pod, stems, and everything else. If you're feeling very energetic and possibly a little foolish, put the bag down on the ground and stomp all over it as if you're sort of doing a harvest jig. It's fun and it accomplishes the job just as well. Once you've done, done enough beating or stomping, I then take a hold of the bag, leaving a little corner open like that, and hold the rest of it up in the air so the beans will fall to the bottom corner. And that way, since the beans are heavier, I can dump them out into a bowl without pouring most of the chaff and the old stems with them. Once they're in that bowl, now comes winnowing. And winnowing is the second part of the operation where you use the wind to separate the light stuff from the heavier beans. Take, take that bowl out in the wind and throw the beans up in the air and then catch them again in the bowl. And while they're up in the air, the wind is blowing the lighter parts away. You do that three, four, five, six times and you end up with a nice clean bowl of beans. Now with rutabagas, another seed we just saved, you can use another trick. These seeds are round. And so after we've scruffled them around in, in the little bag we keep them in, in order to break the seeds away from the pods, we'll use an inclined plane, a board, and just pour the seeds and chaff out on the top edge of it. And the little rutabaga seeds, just like ball bearings, will roll down to the bottom, but all the chaff doesn't roll, and it sits there at the top. And then you can just pour them right off the edge, and you have a nice clean sample of rutabaga seeds. These are tricks that gardeners have been using for thousands of years. And here's another one for fruits with pulp, like this tomato. You treat those a little differently. You cut the tomato in half, scoop out the pulp, and then you want to ferment the pulp to free up the seeds inside it. Now, the way you do that is to put them in a glass jar and add a little water and just leave it there for about three or four days. I would tightly cover the jar because, frankly, it's going to get really stinky in there and you're going to see a whole covering of white mold by the time you're done. You'll also see that the seeds are sinking to the bottom of the jar. Now, after about three or four days, you want to uncover it and fill the whole thing with water and shake it a little bit and dump it over a sieve to catch the seeds. Then turn the sieve upside down over just a small, ordinary window screen, spread and just let that dry. A sunny spot is fine if it's not a windy day. You don't want to lose all those precious seeds. Anyway, a nice warm location would do fine. Now, peppers are the same thing, only even simpler because they don't have that mushy pulp. So all you have to do is open the pepper, whether it's a small one or a big pepper, and shake out those seeds directly onto the screen, spread them out, and let them dry. And that's all there is to it. Once my seeds are nice and dry, I want to keep them that way for the winter. So I'll put them in little envelopes, and then I'll put all those envelopes inside a tightly sealed glass jar. Moisture won't get in, rodents won't get in, bugs won't get in. You know, Elliot, I keep thinking about that man who saved 500 different kinds of beans. He must have had a fun project. He also must have had a very pretty collection. You know, he's also doing something very important for the planet. Thousands of varieties went into the breeding of the crops that we grow and eat today. But agriculture has become so standardized that we've gotten ourselves down to a few winners. And by only growing and selling those worldwide, we're in danger of losing that genetic diversity that produced these bounteous crops. 
Now, you can reverse that process in your own home garden by saving seeds. And it's really easy. In fact, it's self-selecting. The only plants that are going to look nice enough to save seed from are the ones that are adapted to your soil and your climate. The work is almost done for you. A good example of this are the people who are always trying to break records with large vegetables. Well, when they save seed from that pumpkin that's large enough for Cinderella, or the onion that rivals a basketball, or the 10-pound carrot, they are continuing to select for the standards that they want, maybe to break another record next year. Now, we're not trying to break records. We're merely trying to adapt the vegetables to our soil and climate so they get better every year. So whether you live in Maine or Florida, California, Idaho, you're constantly improving your crop from year to year by saving seeds from the best. And you just might get the sweetest little tomato you ever ate. So save some seeds and become a part of history. And for now, goodbye and good gardening. If you want to learn more about heirloom varieties and seed saving, these two books, Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth and The Garden Seed Inventory by Kent Wheely, are available from the Seed Savers Exchange in Decorah, Iowa. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Home Bodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how.